Welcome, I'm Dr. Anthony Goodman, and today we will begin the first of 24 lectures on how the body defends itself in a constantly uh, hostile environment, how it will protect itself under all conditions. We sometimes think of our environment as safe and pleasant, lying on the beach in a, in a vacation. We don't really make ourselves aware of the fact that the ultraviolet light is out there trying to give us cancer of the skin. We may be in an elevator or an airplane on the way to a holiday and forget about the myriad of germs and other molecules from other people's bodies that are trying to get into our bodies. We might be in our car safely belted in and we forget about the 5,000 pounds of steel from somebody else's car that might be trying to get into our car as well. And there are allergens and toxic animals and stinging ants at a family picnic. So even things that look safe and we think of as safe really aren't safe. Our environment is a very hostile place. Now, if this were a college course or a medical school course, we would probably call it human pathophysiology. Physiology is the study of how systems and organs function, how things work inside the body. And patho refers to the disease state. So pathophysiology is the study of disease processes and our reactions to them. In my previous teaching company course, which was called Understanding the Human Body, Anatomy and Physiology, we looked at the body through complete organ systems. We looked at each system, the heart, the lungs, the brain, the GI tract, and then we studied the gross and the microscopic anatomy of those systems, which is the structure. And then we would take a look at the physiology, which is how each system functioned. After that, we looked at organ-specific examples of system failure, heart attacks, respiratory failure, stroke, injuries, or what we called what can go wrong. And what we found was that much of the audience found that the disease processes were as fascinating as the anatomy and the function under normal circumstances or in the healthy patient. So much so that I decided to devote an entire course uh, to the way our bodies fail and in the wonderful ways that they can heal themselves. But you might want to know why a general surgeon, which is what I am, would be giving a course on pathophysiology. So let me tell you a little bit about my background and about general surgery in general to answer that question. Let me say first, it was very hard to stay on track toward becoming a general surgeon while I was in medical school, even though I decided that I wanted to be a general surgeon in the sixth grade and never once had any second thoughts. But there is, and I think there always has been, a strong intellectual bias against surgery. Um, there was a prevailing joke at the time, and I think there still is, that when the elevated door is closing, the physician runs up and sticks his hand in the door, and the surgeon comes in and, um, and sticks his head in the door to stop the door from closing. And this anti-surgical bias may stem from the origins of the surgeon back many centuries, when the surgeons were not medical doctors, but they were barbers. The barber surgeon was one of the most prevalent medical practitioners of the Middle Ages, and he was generally charged with taking care of soldiers on the battlefield, treating wounds, treating infections, stopping bleeding, and there was little that they can do in the way of surgery and actually have the patient survive. The only kind of jobs were lancing boils, cleaning up infections, suturing wounds, and I might say they did that without any anesthesia because anesthesia hadn't been invented at that time yet. And they often just did a lot of bloodletting. This was because they believed that patients were often suffering from evil humors, and those evil humors had to be let out of the body with the blood. So this was all the job of the barber surgeon who was not a medical doctor. And today, in places like England and the rest of the former British Empire, when a physician finishes specialty training in surgery, they are no longer called doctor, but they return to the title of mister, which is a tribute back to the ages of the surgeon uh, who was really a barber. And a fully trained surgeon today actually thinks it's rude if someone refers to them as doctor. They are always called mister. Now, throughout my 30 years as a surgeon, when I met someone who would 
not know me and learn that I was a general surgeon, they'd often say, are you a specialist or are you just a general surgeon? And I always heard disdain in that just a general surgeon. My stomach would tighten, my lip would pout, and I would answer again and again, no, I'm just a general surgeon. Well, who am I and why am I giving this series of lectures and what is a general surgeon? The general surgeon's education begins in college, four years of college, and then four years of medical school, which is pretty standard. And then there's usually a postgraduate residency training program of about four to six years. In my case, there was another couple of years in the Army, so it took me about 16 years before I actually got out to make my living in the world as a surgeon. And over the years, I used to give oral exams, which are required by the American Board of Surgery, in which we would examine the new candidates who had also completed their four to six years of training. And we always started our sessions by reminding the candidate that this was the American Board of Surgery. This was not the American Board of General Surgery. So we were going to examine them in general surgery and in neurosurgery, and in cardiac surgery, and in pulmonary surgery, orthopedic surgery, OBGYN, plastic surgery, and other areas of surgical specialties, not just general surgery. And in our first two years, we would also rotate through all the specialties. We might have only four or six months on general surgery itself, and then we would go through all those surgical subspecialties as a resident on that service. In, in addition to that, most specialists who do go on to neurosurgery and other forms of specialization must have at least two years of general surgery before they then focus on their own practice, of, let's say orthopedics, and in fact, certain specialties such as neurosurgery and heart surgery and even plastic surgery, those candidates have to go through a full general surgical training program before they enter their specialty. So again, why? Why is there all this uh, specialization and wide range of knowledge that you need to acquire? Let me give you a case history. 75-year-old man is driving down the highway. 70 miles an hour, he suffers a heart attack. Keels over at the wheel, crashes into a bridge abutment at about 70 miles an hour, fractures six ribs, collapses his lung. He suffers fractures of his left thigh, he has a head injury with prolonged unconsciousness, arrives in the emergency room unconscious. He's also found to have a ruptured left kidney, and also he's diabetic. Now, who's in charge of this patient? Who is the emergency room doctor going to call? And the answer is he's going to call the general surgeon. You can call just a general surgeon. Even though the general surgeon is probably not going to operate on this patient at all. In the ER, there's going to be a whole flurry of caregivers and people all just rumbling around the patient, starting IVs, arterial lines, typing blood. They're going to get x-rays. They're going to perform all the laboratory work they need to do while the specialists are arriving. And all the immediate treatment will be started, including perhaps putting in a chest tube in this patient to reinflate a collapsed lung, placing a urinary catheter, to monitor urinary output, and so on. The patient's going to receive hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of treatment in a very short period of time. Nothing's going to be spared, no matter what the cost. And whether the patient pays for it himself, the insurance company, or the government, everything's going to be done to keep that patient alive and well. And you have to compare this to other places in the world where the average per capita allowance for health care is $10 per year per patient. So we live in a very luxurious place where we have a great many privileges when it comes to medical care. The general surgeon job at that point is to coordinate the specialists who are waiting to care for this patient. And he won't leave the case until this patient is down to one or two last non-threatening illnesses that can be cared for by one other physician. The first thing the general surgeon is going to do is called triage. And this in the battlefield was an awful job. It was given to the most senior surgeon, the most experienced man on the team. And in fact, that surgeon was pulled out of the operating room to act as the triage officer. 
triage is separating in the battlefield those who can be saved from those who cannot be saved and not wasting any precious resources on someone who is a sure fatality. This is a very hard thing to do. And this is a time of limited resources, both human and physical resources, so the triage officer may also have to decide who can most quickly be returned to battle and take care of those patients first in a time of war. In civilian times, it's a little bit different. Outside of the realm of something like 921, I'm uh, sorry, 911, for example, very much like the battlefield, where the resources are really overwhelmed by the catastrophe, in normal circumstances, triage is a matter of priorities for that single patient. When we have enough facilities to do everything we can, we still need to triage the patient. We need to see what care they need, how much, and when. Who's going to give it? Now, which specialist is really going to step in line first? So let's take a look at our patient once more. This guy's going to need a chest tube, and if there's a chest surgeon uh, available, the chest surgeon will do that. Otherwise, someone else will do it because that lung has to be re-expanded right away. We're going to need a cardiologist to deal with the heart attack and possible rhythm disturbances. The neurosurgeon, in the absence of a brain injury, if this is just a concussion or internal head bleeding uh, or a fracture, that, that neurosurgeon is going to be on standby going to want certain things done for his patient, um, but he's not going to get to operate. The urologist would like to determine whether the injury to the kidney needs immediate attention, perhaps surgery, or whether it can just be observed. Orthopedic specialist would probably go to the end of the line. Once that leg is immobilized, the broken femur that we talked about, and determine there's no threat, let's say, to losing the limb because of a vascular injury, the um, orthopedic surgeon is actually going to be off this case. As these triage decisions are made, it's the general surgeon who's going to make them. And he's going to consult with each of the specialists. And there's going to be conflicts. Somebody's got to decide how to resolve those conflicts. For example, in this case, the neurosurgeon and the cardiologist will want to limit the patient's fluid intake. We don't want to overload the heart, and we certainly don't want brain swelling to get out of hand. But the urologist is going to want lots of fluid to flush out those kidneys, get rid of blood clots, and make sure the kidney is functioning. And the neurosurgeon still wants to minimize brain swelling. So the general surgeon is there really as a mediator on the case and to decide who's going to get to do what, how much, and when. The orthopedic surgeon doesn't care one way or another. He's probably going to be gone once that leg is immobilized. The neurosurgeon also may want to use steroids. These are drugs to reduce brain swelling. The endocrinologist looking after this patient's diabetes is not going to want to use steroids at all because they're going to make the diabetes harder to manage. So all these different factors are going to have to be weighed there's some balancing that's going to be, have to be done, compromises and judgment calls. And in consultation with each of these specialists, who's going to be focused only on one thing, the general surgeon is going to look after the total patient, the complete welfare of this individual. So in many ways, this is really uh, bipartisanism at its best. This is where all the factors are going to have to come into play. So that's why, even though I'm just a general surgeon, I'm really interested in this subject. I've been involved of literally hundreds of cases just like this one. And uh, through each one, they may have looked at different, different ways that um, we can approach the subject. I still need to know how the different breakdown uh, areas of the bodies get involved in this injury or infection or other disease and how it's going to need to be repaired, whether surgically, medically, or by the patient themselves. Lots of our diseases go away by themselves if we just leave them alone. I'm eager and happy to bring some of this information to you, and I'd like to organize it in what I hope will be an understandable format so that after this is all over, you'll be able to apply it to questions that come up and at least know where to look for the answers. For the purpose of this course, I really want you to look at the body as a fortress, encased in skin 
and surrounded by a world brimming with potential enemies. They are both on the outside, and some of those are going to be on the inside, and they are all waiting to invade and destroy the integrity of your fortress. We really are surrounded by a hostile environment. Even variations in atmospheric temperature are way too great in most environments for us to survive without really good systems and protection to maintain stability. The same is true for water and salt balance, acid and base balance. We live within a very, very narrow range, and this is both our blessing and our curse. We're very, very versatile. We can go lots of places other animals can't go. Compared, for example, with a snake, a fish, both of whom are cold-blooded, our existence is dependent on our ability to manage this delicate balance while theirs is to conform to nature. We, uh, without even thinking about it, can make sure that our bodies are safe and that we can go and do as we please. And the analogy to a fortified position, I think, is really apt because on the outside, there are lots of enemies. These include, for example, on the outside, infectious diseases, those that are already on our body that we're ho holding back, other people spewing germs into the air that we breathe, people handling our food germs going from one person to another, from an animal to us, or just floating around in the air. There are parasites, which are passed from person to person, or from animal to person, and that can infect people. There are environmental toxins in our water, in our food, in the air we breathe. There's trauma from physical missiles and heavy steel masses, allergens in the air. We are constantly bombarded, and we don't even think about it. Body just takes care of it. Internally, there are overprotections of our systems which may harm us, like allergies, immune responses, diversion of blood supply from one organ to the other, which may hurt another organ in favor of another organ, and of course, cancer. So this course is gonna focus on big categories, the threats to the human fortress, and then our responses and our defenses to hold them off, and then how we heal the body if we are unable to stop the damage that's caused. We'll start first with fundamentals of cell biology, both molecular and microscopic structure and function of the individual cell. This is the smallest basic building block in our body. It's the smallest self-replicating and functioning unit. Nothing below that is independent. This unit from single-celled animals, such as amoeba, to the complex organisms, such as primates, which is what we are, have a cellular structure that's basically the same. There's a complete set of components. They can sustain their own life, energy, metabolism, passing information from one to the other, disposal of wastes, uh, integrity of the structure, the cell wall, the brick wall, and every cell is connected intimately with the uh, nutrition and waste disposal systems of the whole body. By examining the normal cell structure and function, as well as the response to various forms of invasion or challenge, we can then extrapolate upward and look at the responses of organs and tissues and the whole body. And this course will examine each of those systems. We will look at the first, the inflammatory response, which is ancient, it's millions of years old, came to Earth far before humans did, carefully conserved through evolution, and it is the reaction of the body's invasion by any external and some internal threats. It's usually titled with the term itis, so arthritis is inflammation of a joint, encephalitis, inflammation of the brain, uh, appendicitis, inflammation of the appendix, and so on. These are all inflammatory responses to disease, invasion, and injury. And they're all similar in their specifics. It doesn't change no matter what the attack. When we look at that response over a span of three lectures, we'll see how the body responds and we'll see the details from the molecular level all the way up to the cellular and then on up to the entire body. And then we'll extrapolate how any organ system might respond to an attack. Then after that, we'll follow up with three more lectures and get the big picture on the immune response 
what we call stranger danger. We'll examine how this is different from the inflammatory response and how it is the same, and how at a cellular level, the whole body can respond the same as with a molecular level. And with the inflammatory response, on the same plane, we'll look at how the immune response might succeed or fail, and how overreaction might hurt the individual. We are protected by systems, as Shakespeare said in Henry IV, that are like a rich armor worn in the heat of day that scalds with safety. And the immune system can hurt us sometimes instead of helping us. Then we'll take a look in great detail at infectious diseases. We, over a course of eight lectures with a huge number of microorganisms, organisms we cannot see, that account for the most pervasive threat to our well-being and survival. Infectious diseases uh, will, that will be studied and show us how to understand the categories of organisms, bacteria, viruses, rickettsia, parasites, and so on, and we'll see their similarities, their differences, and where they stand in the spectrum. We'll look at the progress that we've made over the centuries uh, both before and since we've even recognized these as illness, and then examples of treatment like cholera before anybody knew what the cholera organism even was, what caused the disease, uh, the prevention and treatment of smallpox long before anybody even knew what a virus was. These are legacies of really brilliant epidemiologists and doctors who were the detectives of the medical world. In terms of the biosphere, which is this layer, a uh, very, very thin layer that surrounds our Earth, um, we are very, very small fraction of that mass. The lowly roundworm, which we'll talk about in later lectures, occupies a mass that actually dwarfs the combined total of all mammals and larger beings put together. If you put these with the rest of the microorganisms, viruses and bacteria, it's no contest. We hardly fit in the picture at all. So there is, understandably, an ongoing battle between some of us and some of these organisms, as well as a symbiosis in which we depend or they depend upon us for survival and our well-being. We'll explore the really fascinating uh, life cycles of parasites and tropical diseases, which account for more illness and death than probably all the other causes put together if you take just pure numbers of patients who are infected. And though we in the first world who live largely free of the threat of these parasites forget that there are millions of people each year who die in less developed countries from diseases that have been completely eradicated here at home. The next two lectures are going to talk about trauma and shock, and we'll look at the great plague of modern society, the interaction of the soft human body with big steel masses and some very small masses of lead coming out of the barrel of a gun at high velocity. We'll look at the disease processes that can also disrupt the final common pathway that all forms of shock share. The brain, the heart, the vital organs, and its circulation. And we'll see how those differ and how they're the same and how we might treat them. We need at that point to really join the neurologists who love to tell us that everything in our body is there to serve the brain. The heart pumps blood to the brain, giving it oxygen and food. The kidney purifies the blood for the brain. The GI tract absorbs nourishment for the brain and the bones in the skull protect the brain. The brain transplant, for example, if it ever could be done, it's certainly not on the horizon, but if we could transplant a brain from Alice to John, the result would be Alice in a new body, despite the fact that it just looks like John. Everything we could see, measure, or touch about that new person would be John, but it's really Alice. The brain is the sum of our experience, our inherited knowledge, our learned knowledge, and our potential for doing good things and bad things. So the brain is the, really the center of what makes us very, very special on this planet. We'll again see all the underlying causes which might, in the end, disrupt that basic body function, the transport of oxygen and nutrients 
to the brain and other cells in our body. That will end our look at the section on trauma and shock. And then we'll look in the next five lectures at what I call the enemy within or the self-inflicted wound. We're going to take a very careful look at cancer. We'll see how the very nature of life on Earth, how our evolution and transformation uh, from the most primitive chemicals went hand in hand with our susceptibility to cancer. Life on Earth is, has its information transmitted by DNA. It's the custodian of the genetic, genetic and reproductive um, functions. And if this were a stable molecule, which DNA isn't, such as water or salt, takes huge energy, energy to disrupt water or salt, but DNA is fragile. If it were stable, then we would still be in that primordial soup. Nothing would change. Those chemicals that made up DNA would stay locked and no mutations could occur. But DNA is very fragile, very complex, and so it's easily mutable which means changeable. And this fragility uh, brings with it the chance for mutations that can evolve from the lowest to the highest forms and ultimately to real intelligence. But it's a two-edged sword because there can be changes which are not so desirable with DNA. So this change, which bring cells into a state where they become aggressive and not good neighbors is something we call cancer. It's an internal threat at the molecular level and it's using survival of the fittest to get ahead and ultimately to destroy the host, which happens to be us. We'll look at the causes from our environment, which is why I call this the self-inflicted wound. We'll look at genetic susceptibility and the molecular mechanisms as well as the cellular defects that are in cancer. And we'll look at the possibilities for prevention and cure and review prototypes in various stages of evolution in the um, bringing to our body of cancer from within. We'll look at all the possibilities at how we might get away with this and the differences in our treatment. And finally, we'll end with wound healing. This is going to be the prototype for the healing process of the whole body in general. And this is a course on healing. It's a course of what can go wrong and then how we can heal and make it better. By the end of the course, I hope you'll have the tools that you can apply what you learn from the big picture to a specific disease. While it's impossible for us to cover every single disease in every different system, I'm going to try to give you a look at lots of different ways the body is invaded, lots of different ways these invaders function and try to hurt us, and then how we respond, and ultimately, again, how we heal to get through our life's time. We uh, can't cover all the diseases, but if you look at the inflammatory response, the immune response, the life cycles of the parasites, and the modes of attacks of infectious diseases. It should make your learning easier, and it should give you the vocabulary with a little repetition to understand where these words come from, what we're saying, and what we mean. And it's very important that we establish the vocabulary early so that we can go on and make sure we're always talking about the same thing. We may not be able to go into the details of a specific cancer or the mechanism of func dysfunction in HIV AIDS, but you should be able to place them in a pattern and be able by the end of the course to know where they go in this big structure that we call pathophysiology. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here to share the journey with me. I hope when we come back, uh, you'll be looking forward to taking a good look at our own building block, the basic structure of our body, called the cell.